reflected through this policy movement or even for example in a place like Maharashtra, the anti uh, anti diamond movement got converted into movement for sugar cooperative. Now this type of movement will take place in Bihar proper. Now not only that, that here the unit of social movement was cast. The, it, it was not a multi uh, regional movement or multi basic uh, movement, but essentially the unit of the social movement was cast. And that in the way of development of intermediate identity or uh, one development of sort of nationalism in this part of the country. That I have elaborately dealt in my paper, which I am not going into the details. Now, one of the problems why, why I wanted to give this question is that Bihar being part of the Hindi heartland, the Bihar uh, was a, this is the area which was also part of the Siva Mutiny. Area. And this, this area was subject to maximum repression during the post environment. So this area developed some sort of a resistance to modernization and modern ideas. So the intellectual catchment area of this area was part of Banaras University or Ali. So that also, that also uh, to some extent determined the socio-economic profile subsequently or the intellectual profile of this area. Now I would not like to go into on these questions because I have dealt elaborately and this will take substantial time. But the uh, thing which I would like to uh, deal a little bit elaborately here that the status of the present economic scenario in Bihar uh, which has not been dealt possibly in greater details which has shown some tendency towards acceleration in Bihar there is a clear tendency towards acceleration. The average industrial growth rate for the country as a whole has increased from 5% in the 60s to about 8% in the 80s. During the 60s, the industrial growth rate in Bihar was roughly the same as the national growth rate. But thereafter, it has decelerated from 5% to almost 4% in the 80s. We passed then at 5.0% and share of output has indeed risen from 5.1% to 5.3%. Again, in the beginning of it, labor productivity in India was about 2.4 times than in Bihar. But by the end of the decade, the figure had come down to 1.5%. Thus, the acceleration in the growth rate of industry in Bihar is primarily because of the slower growth rate of smaller industrial units. So now, if the larger industry in Bihar at a higher rate than the smaller industry, then it can only be that the sustaining power of these two subsectors, larger and small, are different. It is reasonable to conclude that the large industries in Bihar, in the basic metals and transport equipments, which operate in the national and international market, many of the other industries for which inputs are available locally or whose output would find a home market, food products, jute products, food products, or metal products, are existing in Bihar only marginally. That the industrialization in Bihar may become still slower in near future is indicated by the current investment pattern. The per capita annual investment here is only 2200, which is the lowest in India and less than one fourth of the national average of uh, 9,200. Earlier, the trend of public sector investment being the larger component of the total investment is continuing. Only one-fourth of the total investment in Bihar is from the private sector now, that which is one of the lowest in India. Thus, Bihar receives barely 1.2% of the total private investment in India and 2.5% of the total investment in India, public and private put together. If we remember that Bihar accounts for 10% of India's population, then these figures are indicative of further deceleration for industries in Bihar. Even if we take the current level of industrial output in Bihar, which is about 5% of the national industrial output, the current investment level is quite alarming. Another important aspect of such structural description of the economy relates to the kinds of industrial products a region is producing and degree to which the different product-based sectors are integrated around themselves. 
even a limited familiarity with the product structure of the industries of Bihar would reveal that a larger part of his industries is engaged in primary processing of mining output, transforming iron ore into steel, mica into finished mica, or producing basic chemicals. The latest stages of the production involving transformation of these semi finished products into finished products for consumption is conspicuous by their absence in Bihar. Thus, a considerable portion of the industries in Bihar are indeed an extension of, a, of its mining sector. The industries of the state, state transform different mining outputs into more usable forms for industries in other regions of the country and to the benefit of the latter, forging the immense opportunity of effecting a vertical integration of the industries at the regional level. The absence of such integration makes most of the industrial se sector insensitive and to increase production level in other sectors of the state's economy. Thus, an additional steel plant in Bihar would not make any substantial difference in the production level of local mica or structured clay products. And, se and the sectors which are likely to benefit from such an additional steel plant, say metal products or non-electrical machinery, are not located in Bihar. Thus, most widely identified constant on industrial growth of Bihar is poor status of its industrial infrastructure. Now, this observation is not devoid of any empirical basis. But surprisingly, an index of industrial infrastructure computed by CMI uh, shows Bihar's index to be 96. Taking the national index as 100, of the 15 major, uh, 15 major Indian states, at least 6 have a lower index than Bihar. The index uh, for uh, Madhya Pradesh is 97, which is just as good as Bihar's. Whereas uh, Madhya Pradesh has been able to attract much more investment. As is well known, at least five of these states, Karnataka, Maharashtra, uh, Madhya Pradesh, Urissa, Rajasthan, Tamil Nadu, are attracting far more investment than in Bihar. Thus, the observation of obvious limitations are more critical than in their different characteristics. Notwithstanding the fact that the economic characteristics of the five selective studies in the present study are very dissimilar. In this section, towards understanding the entrepreneurial pattern in different districts, we first discuss the different economic regions of Bihar uh, and how the chosen districts correspond, and correspond to those economic regions. This is followed by a discussion on the structure of agricultural economics of Bihar plain as we have later tried to link the entrepreneurial development in such region with its agricultural economy where from the surplus must have been generated. The traditional characteristic of these economies have changed to some extent because of the post-independent policies on rural development and which form next part of our discussion. All these together, the different regions, the agricultural economics and the post-independent development policies form the requisite backdrop for analyzing the entrepreneurial behavior at local level. Now, the economic regions of Bihar play. The districts of Bihar economically and socially heterogeneous. Some of the variations is due to marked difference between gigantic plains and ecologically distinct southern plateau, part of which have large tribal population. To maintain some semblance of uniformity, the districts selected for the study are from North and South Bihar plain. But even among the districts of the plains, considerable difference in the economic structure are apparent. According to a statistical study which uh, had taken into account 26 demographic and economic variables. 24 districts of Bihar plain, as it was in 1978, uh, was grouped into six homogeneous clusters. The clusters were uh, A, B, C, D, E, F. Now, in the first cluster, Patna, Nalanda and Mimsurai fell. In the second, Aurangabad, Bhojpur, Rotas and Champaran uh, West. Cluster C, Gaya, Navada, Mujapurpur, Bhagalpur and Mingue. Cluster E, Champaran, East, Sitamari, Madhubani, Samastipur, and Cluster A, Dharmanga, Sarasa, Purmiya, and Katiyar. A familiarity with the visual pattern of agriculture development within Bihar would indicate that Cluster A and C both develop regions with relatively capital intensive tubal irrigation based agriculture. However, Cluster A in a sense is more developed because of higher urbanization 
and literacy. Incidentally, the river Ganga also divides the cluster A from C. And cluster B is also a relatively developed area. Now, here I have, uh, in our analysis of the two districts uh, are from cluster A, Nalanda and Beusare, as mentioned before, both are uh, from relatively agriculturally advanced regions. But Beusare has a special characteristic which was not included in the above cluster analysis, namely the presence of a large public sector industry associated with other industries, mostly in small and medium scale sector. From cluster B, we have selected Rotas, which has prosperous agricultural economy. Some industries in the private sector both have longer history. From cluster D, we have selected Mujapurpur, has been studied there basically to examine the entrepreneurial behavior associated with surplus generated from trading sector. Finally, Madhubani is the fifth district of our study, is a typical representative of an area which is backward even by Bihar standards agriculturally or industrially. There will be number of social and economic factors determining the entrepreneurial development in an area. Now, I have uh, here discussed the agricultural structure uh, in this uh, area and how uh, the agricultural structure, how the, what were the effects of the permanent settlement and uh, in the post-independence period, what extent the rural development policy intervened in the evolution of this area. Now, this has the indigenous status being ritualistically lower and, and the political nexus of the upper caste leadership with the West regional capitals made the Marwadi's natural commercial partner. The trade in Bihar could be classified into two categories. One on the basis of government patronage another on the basis of business connections dealing with the leadership of the corporate or multi dealership of the corporate or multinational corporations. In the first category, most of the trade licenses like steel, fertilizer, fair price shops would go to upper caste scales because of their political proximity, but in the later case, it goes to the Marwani or Gujarati. The government contracts for public works are also cornered by the upper caste rural oligarchy. Even smugglers, after sufficiently accumulating, would like to legitimize their wealth through the government contracts. Awarding of contracts depends on the muscle and gun power of the respective contenders. Often on the formal day of announcement of the contract, the place of the concerned apartment would be converted into battleground. Insulation of North Sea and the lack of sufficient railway network uh, has also resulted in massive development of road transport in private sector and entrepreneurs who have taken up initiatives in this sector are mainly local people, again from the upper caste. The road transport is a lifeline of North Bihar. A substantial part of the communication to Nepal is by road. In the Hindi heartland, especially in Bihar, the nascent subnationalism has got fused with resurgence for Hindu identity. And these have resulted into frequent pilgrimage to the different religious shrines. The road transport has also got filled because of this, the capital which got invested in road transport is primarily through the surplus generated. Uh, the capital which uh, got invested in road transport is primarily through the surplus generated from the public contract. Large scale smuggling of narcotic, expensive foreign consumer goods, and some of the agricultural surplus. There have been isolated instances when unemployed youth have taken loans from the commercial bank to fly buses for passenger transport or trucks. Flying of trucks or buses in Bihar is not possible only through economic hegemony. For state and unhindered road transport business, social and political support is a necessary precondition. The upper class entrepreneurs dominated this sector because of their strong political and social connections along with buccaneering accumulation that they had resorted to other means. The Tendri 15 would indicate that the value of output of major crops is much lower in Mojapurpur and Madhubani and even below the state average, but it is higher in Bimsai. The entire North Bihar is flood prone, which is the bottleneck for agricultural development. Public investment to control the flood has not significant has not been significant to promote agricultural production. In Begusai, an embankment was constructed for protecting its lowland from Ganga flood in the late 19th century. 
this embankment has contributed to a relatively high productivity of agriculture. Apart from public investment in embankment, the concentration of land in few hands is relatively less in Begusar, unlike in Madhubani and Madhupurpur. All these three districts witnessed peasant movement of varying intensity. Movement against tenancy was much more pronounced in Madhubani. Nevertheless, the capitalist transformation in agriculture was witnessed to some extent in Begusar. In fact, Commercialization of agriculture has been spearheaded by the liberal brand of Congress and the Communist Party of India. Incidentally, uh, the two ministers of power and education belonged from this area in the early 50s and late 60s. They were responsible for widespread tubal irrigation and modernization of agriculture. The surplus that was generated in agriculture was either redeployed in agriculture or gone into small scale industry or in education to produce professional. One does not see this phenomena in Madhubani at all or in large uh, measure in Madhubani. Now, uh, I would not like to elaborate further about the what we are saying. The question is asking me to conclude. Now, but my effort is to integrate, I mean, possibly I will be able to integrate the uh, provincial scenario with the local uh, scenario and try to build up or construct on the basis of that. Thank you.
uh, there was no reason why he could not have followed the pattern in the Central Broad or Central Broad or other states of the Belgium that sort of uh, uh, followed because the resources, the natural resources are almost neutral in the industry. Uh, and the technological manpower is again neutral in, in, in the particular context. But for one reason or the other, uh, these industries did not uh, take root in India, whereas they took root in other, in, uh, other parts. And private sector entrepreneurship in India, of course, has been extremely limited, extremely limited in, uh, in industrial manufacturing and has been confined to extractive uh, uh, industries, whether it's mining or whether it's cement manufacturing uh, or oil extraction. These are the only, only three uh, major areas which uh, private sector investment is taken. Uh, there is very little private sector investment in manufacturing. So, Mr. Chairman, I'll indicate about all these things in this conversation. I find this paper very interesting, and, and I think it's you know, there's been so little on this, but it's, 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 it's a very important paper in well. Um, I'd like to ask you something. Okay. Rather a comment, I suppose, on the, the question of, of the, the backwardness, uh, backwardness of industrial development. And I think you relate it in, of course, I don't to pull back with it, but I, I understand that you related, related to the, the backwardness of, of, of agriculture. Now, I, in, in a perhaps longer historical perspective, I would, uh, one, one may try to turn it, that around and say that it's exactly the, uh, the relative high state of development of, of agriculture in the 1890th century of, of Bihar that creates that, that, that precondition. It, it may very well be that the abundant availability of natural resources hinders a certain development. This is, this is entirely consistent with, with some new uh, new economic theories that, that, for example, compares East Asia and, and, and Africa, which says that if you don't have these natural resources, you're forced to do something something else. So, for example, education and you know skill-intensive uh, kind of man manufacturing will develop exactly where these natural resources are not available. So, in that context, I mean, like I said, you know, it's, it's not that I have developed this idea fully, but it, it seems that in that context, the availability of, of natural resources and, and subsequently non-development are actually not so not so surprising. Are actually quite quite consistent with that. Uh, I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, have you been collecting uh, perceptions and in the sense uh, on this? I mean, they also have been like that, and many of them trying and failing and uh, all of this. So, like an entrepreneur wants to do nothing with she, the way she, she, but still, uh, they want uh, the management, they want uh, labor trouble, you know to be controlled or the state helping them to control the labor trouble, they want the political stability and uh, they want the uh, rules and procedures which uh, we actually have a perception in Jamshedpur where everybody complains about I mean, the industrial area in Jamshedpur, they complain about difficulty in getting electricity, licensing, quota and all of it and they say they have critical difficulty. So have you been looking at this kind of perception? Bihar has been known for lack of entrepreneurship and that is uh, to be one of the reasons behind the that word next because people have opted for either for government service or they have gone for contract. And even in the limited field of entrepreneurship, whatever investment has been made that is mostly in the field of uh, cinema halls and transport. So I wanted to know what are the reasons that have inspired people to invest in these two fields. Okay. Cinema halls and trans uh, transport. And uh, in the present circumstances with the uh, appalling law and order situation when it is not an easy job to fly buses and trucks. And when people complain that in one trip one may has to pay 500 to 1000 rupees per trip as an Andari tax. And uh, the transport owners say that even if conductors and classes pay 1,000 rupees, 
they report to the owner that it is only 100 or 200 rupees so that they are not removed from the job by the owner. And they compensated by hiring passengers because owner doesn't know how many passengers have been hired. So despite all these risks, risks people are investing in this industry, in this sector. So that is what I wanted to know from you. These intermediate cars consist of consisting of Koiri, Kurmi, Yadwal. They have shown this remarkable entrepreneurship. Now, what is the constraint in the infrastructure development and even the needed agrarian reforms? And therefore, and the role of the state is also important here, you see, in providing that uh, needed uh, kind of infrastructure. And so, if that precondition is made, then perhaps you see that is good possible of uh, the agricultural entrepreneurship developing this is from among these uh, engineering cars. The second point is that you see in the Muzaffarpur region, you have this small entrepreneurship who are entering into, uh, who have been traditionally also entered into agriculture and horticultural field. And there also there is you see, the infrastructure constraints and so if that is developed, then you see there perhaps. But then you see for the Indian industrial entrepreneurship, you see perhaps uh, Bihar does not have the Indian VP. So you need passes like the Chenji Tata or Marwaris, you see, uh, really to uh, kind of, uh, or uh, maybe even the six you might need for the entrepreneurship in Bihar. And therefore, why not you see, uh, ask them to come to develop entrepreneurship in Bihar. I have just one comment, uh, and that's uh, maybe uh, this is the fact that maybe, maybe you'd like to complicate your passing observation about the lack of Muslim entrepreneurship because we actually do, uh, you know, one area that was affected by its migration, but I don't know how much of that. Stock exchange also contributed to 
not the club to the club. The whole idea of investment in industry was absent. Especially in the
in a situation like this, we are going to be the cultural uh, hunger, the cultural salvation. Cinema, cinema houses do provide a, a market for a commodity which is, which, is, which is valued. And if you control that commodity, then you control, uh, control a lot uh, of, of the social life of the state. Hence, the uh, investment in cinema houses, you know, the biggest movement, social movements in Bihar in the recent past have, uh, have uh, started with uh, uh, on, on the issue of cinema tickets. Even the so-called JT movement of 1974 started when uh, cinema tickets were not sold in Indian cinema. Uh, so there is a control over that their resource. <laughs> yes, you uh, so That is one. Transport is concerned. Why? You are right that it is a very dangerous, hazardous uh, investment. But never say it has, it, has, it has returns which are not only economic but also political. When you have controlled transport, then you control the movement of labor. If you have your, if you have just going to apply some bureaucrats and powers that be, because it was never known to come across an area where people have invested in it. I Now, I, I will give you some, some instant quite detail. Um, I can uh, take this. Uh, I have to find it. I forgot to find Almost every brand of uh, drugs are easily available here. And there are some of the largest uh, uh, so called drug manufacturers who are nominated even to the rank as, as uh, uh, people who are <laughs> national service. Are in, involved in manufacturing uh, that. Now this again is not not irrational. You know when when the mode of accumulation is primitive, then it is most primitive in the most primitive way. <laughs> now uh, I would like to put in that we that is very like politics also. Now out of two karo, uh, I mean that would uh, give some answer to Sudan uh, Shu's way. Uh, substantial portion was spent in the marriage or in the star ceremony, in the world of work on the Second was buying of taxes. People bought a number of taxes. At that time the prices were much lower. And one person uh, invested for cinema hall. Now cinema hall, I don't, I'm not sure whether people are investing in cinema hall now. But I, I, I can, uh, I'm quite sure that in 70s and 60s, Investment in cinema hall was considered to be hallmark of this because by having a cinema hall, you can patronize number of people, not only the local officials but the local gentry, and the giving a free ticket to anybody uh, was a big event. So, but that is not the thing now. I think. Cinema hall is no more a very important thing now. But of course, bus or the transport is a very important thing even now because uh, transport, I think. It, it continues to be important in, this, in many ways. Because it not only is a hallmark of the city, because it could support the name, things transport or something like that. It is all the time flying all over the district, all over the state. So everybody could refer to that. Apart from economic cities, it is uh, also profitable. And it, it controls many other things. So these are the questions. Sir, uh, uh, this is uh, very I have uh, worked, uh, I have not worked on other industry in state, but I have worked on the villa industry in state. And uh, almost um, 10 years back. But I wanted to update my information recently. Now, villa industry in state was once upon a time was a very flourishing industry in state. That is not the situation now. Uh, in Bela. In Bela. Yeah, it was. Out of we had uh, investigated about there were about 100 units uh, in uh, early 80s. Now about only 10 units are left out of the 100 units. And out of 10, uh, four are functioning, and six are in, 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 in a gasping state. I have not uh, done any study on the Patna or the other industrial state, but I have done substantial work on the Bela industry. I think we can uh, once again find out what is that. I have the right to put it. Yeah, yes. And um, 
पापी एक उसने वही बहुत उसी में जितने में सिंह नालंदा के सिंह इन बिहार से भी आज मार्ग की भी बहुत कम था तो मार्ग में पोजीशन में आंसर दैट क्वेश्चन Uh, had 
from the tribal consciousness to ethnicity consciousness to class consciousness and uh, then ultimately landing into digital consciousness. This is how the, you see, this whole uh, thing has traversed during the co uh, course of last uh, over 200 years. Because this has been, you see, Jharkhand movement has been one of the most prolific movements that the country has. And uh, you see, with this long history, one would expect that, you see, a movement would succeed in its objective. But yet, you see, the success in you, as far as this particular movement is concerned. And therefore, you see how it has uh, traversed the course of uh, its consciousness and uh, where it is now and what is its fate. And therefore, it's a characterization of the movement. And along with that, you see, the growth of uh, the consciousness at different levels. So that is uh, some substance of what uh, I'm going to do. Uh, so uh, uh, a little bit about my involvement and I'm uh, and uh, the methodology. Uh, because you see, I came to the Jharkhand issue uh, rather confronted it seriously between uh, 1975 to 1977. And uh, so, you see, that was the placement, that, that was how I was situated into the Jharkhand situation. Then uh, it uh, made me to think behind, think uh, to the uh, past, and then also project to the future. And therefore, you see, I was uh, there in that physical space of Jharkhand between 1974 to 1977. So that was, you see, one of the most active phase of the contemporary Jharkhand movement. And then, you see, there has been subsequent developments and that, you see, I have been doing to and fro, though I cannot call myself as a Jharkhandi, but nonetheless, you see, it is very strongly within me, strongly internalized. And therefore, you see, I will be reflecting without bias, you see, that uh, my understanding of the whole situation. So, uh, so, uh, so, the social movement for the formation of statehood of Jharkhand has a continuity of last one and a half century, and its attainment is still a question mark. The evolution of Jharkhand consciousness, public identity, interchangeably I am using them, has been a long survey and painful process. The formation of Jharkhand consciousness has witnessed both progressive and retrogressive course. It can be roughly categorized into several phases. The first phase from 1825 to 1900. The second phase from 1935 to 1965. The third phase from 1971 to 1985. The fourth phase from 1985 to 1995. And the fifth phase is the current ongoing uh, process. The first phase can be characterized as formation and consolidation of tribal consciousness. The second phase is the social process of consolidation of tribal consciousness to ethnic consciousness, culminating in Jharkhandi consciousness of the identity. The third phase is marked by the convergence of Jharkhandi consciousness to class consciousness. The fourth phase is the transformation of Jharkhandi consciousness to nationality consciousness. And the fifth phase, that is the current ongoing process, is the dilution to regional consciousness or regional identity. So the first severe threat to tribal consciousness identity was perceived when the British introduced private property rights in land, enforced the Mindari system of land revenue, resulting in the disintegration of communal land in your system, alienation of tribal lands on a large scale, and so on. The major contribution of Jai Paul Singh was uh, to transform the tribal consciousness to Jharkhand ethnicity as of the tribal identity. So the Poles, you see, they fought their own battles, Santals, they fought their own battle, and the Mundas fought their own battle. So here and there, you see, you find more than one group joining together. And therefore, it was, uh, you see, within their traditional uh, uh, consciousness, within the, you see, traditional phenomenology of uh, the tribal consciousness that each one of them fought. And uh, though, you see, all of them faced the similar problem of land alienation and things of this kind. But then, you see, the, it was the contribution of Jaipal Singh that he could forge a high tribal identity 
and so this uh, and so in the individual tribal identity you see got converged into the uh, ethnic identity which one I, I call as the chartered identity or the chartered consciousness and therefore you see it was a big uh, uh, kind of progress from the tribal identity tribal consciousness to chartered consciousness and then you see when Jaipal Singh took up the question so uh, you see all the major tribal rebellions during the 19th century that was more or less you see against exploitation, against economic exploitation and therefore it was essentially a class question with agrarian origin. Um, and then you see when Jaipal Singh uh, took over then you see uh, his was a more kind of political, uh, uh, it was a kind of politico-ethnic uh, struggle for the formation of a separate uh, chartered state. And so the class question, you see, that was undermined, that was diluted. And therefore, you see, from, uh, so, uh, though uh, it was a kind of progressive, uh, it was uh, in the progressive direction, the movement from the tribal to ethnic consciousness. But yet, you see, the agrarian question, that was diluted and that was behind the scene. And so the phenomenon of 70s, which I have discussed very shortly, in which this triumvirate tri leadership, you see, they gave the movement. This was a further advancement in which, you see, uh, it was uh, given an ideological thrust and therefore, you see, it was uh, a further direction to the progress of the movement. And so a class angle was given, a communist ideology was given and therefore, you see, uh, it had the element of a strong impute of uh, communist ideology in so much so that you see that in the rural areas the tribals were fighting the question of land alienation and in the urban areas, in the industrial areas, the workers uh, among whom you see there were uh, the uh, scheduled tribes, there were scheduled caste as also the local workers, they fought together against the exploitation of uh, the money lenders and also the public sector uh, capitalists and also uh, you see other mafia and so a yeah, joint worker present alliance was formed and therefore this was a considerable advancement you see to the struggle which, uh, the, uh, which the tribals were fighting and therefore you see the ethnic consciousness was uh, transformed into class consciousness where you see both the agrarian question and also the uh, issues of the industrial proletariat, you see, they were taken into account. And so uh, it is uh, worth noting that you see in the uh, history of the uh, struggle of the peasant movement in India as also the working class movement in India, there are very few instances where the working class and peasant alliance uh, could be forged. But here you see this was successfully forged. And uh, so that uh, that was, you see, uh, a great uh, advancement. And therefore, you see, uh, this, uh, the 70s movement, you see, this also has salience in several other respects. Number one, you see, this no more uh, was confined within the, uh, within the tribal matrix, because now it involved, you see, also the non-tribal working class. And therefore, you see, one of the very important things to understand about this entire Chartan movement is that you see they have their indigenous nomenclature of characterizing who is an exploiter and so they use the indigenous term diku and <clears throat> so this term diku is essentially you see for the, all those you see who have traditionally exploited uh, the tribals you see particularly on class lines and also discriminated against them and uh, then you see the concept of uh, Jharkhandi, the Jharkhandi consciousness that also got transformed because, uh, as I said, that in the 19th century, the uh, consciousness was within the realm of the tribal consciousness. And then, you see, when Jaipal Singh took over, then also, you see, it was more or less confined within the broader sphere of the uh, tribal ethnic identity, Jharkhand uh, identity, and therefore the Jharkhand issue, the Jharkhand struggle was confined to the tribals. But the 70s the struggle, you see, that gave a fillet that gave a wider social base as far as the Jharkhand movement is concerned and therefore it not only really included the tribals but the concept of Jharkhand itself undergone uh, metamorphosis and uh, transformation and therefore all those people were called Jharkhandis who were the producers in Jharkhand that is you see who was uh, getting exploited and who were producers and so from that point of view it included you see the majority of the working class, the peasantry 
the agricultural laborers, as also the other exploited section. And so you see, this was a big change in the entire history of the Jharkhand uh, movement. Another important thing was, you see, even on the ethnic lines, it widened the social base because, you see, uh, it also included the Kurmi, uh, Kur uh, Kurmi peasants. They also fought, fought hand in glove with the tribals, and so uh, this was, and so both uh, uh, on class lines and also on ethnicity. So the emergence of Jharkhand Timocha on the scene was a significant uh, development in the history of Jharkhand movement. It had a rejuvenating impact on the tribals in particular and exploited sections in general. JMM acquired uh, legitimacy among the suffering masses and was a new way of hope in the political horizon of the region. The concept of Jharkhand was redefined as covering all the producers and exploited sections in the Jharkhand region, irrespective of their caste, class, or tribal origin. Jharkhand was being projected synonymous to Lalkan, that is, liberation from exploiters. JMM uh, gained further ground by resisting the adverse impact of forest policies on tribals in Singhu district. The emergence and growth of JMM not only widened the class battle, but also the ethnicity. In the period between 1979 to 1981 is again very, very important because lot of, uh, the tribals, you see, right from the days that the British came, they were also uh, having the threat of losing their traditional rights over the forest. The British created reserve forests and things of this kind. And therefore, you see, a lot of places where the tribals were themselves settled, they were converted into reserve forests and then, you see, they were alienated from those uh, lands as well. And uh, then uh, during 70s, you see the forest department in order to commercialize, uh, uh, to have more profit and to commercialize the uh, forest produce, they replaced the salt forest with the teak forest. And these teak forests were of no value to the tribals, whereas the salt forest, you see, they had the multiple use. And so the tribals were enraged. And so there was a powerful mobilization of the tribals and they started filling the forest. This is also unheard of. You see, you must heard about the Chipko movement, where uh, in uh, your uh, 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 in your UP Hill area, the uh, people, the men and women, you see, they uh, kind of uh, uh, they just protected the forest, protected the trees. Here, you see, it was filling the forest, not because you see the tribals were angry with the trees, but the tribals were angry with the foresters, tribals were angry with the forest policies, and therefore, you see, while the 1974 to 77 movement was called as Dhan Andolan, this 79 to 81 movement was, you see, Jangal Kato Andolan. And you know, it is one of the richest forests in the country, and I have made several visits to that place, you see, during the 80s. And then you see, there also there was a uh, lot of clashes and uh, there was a uh, lot of tensions, violence, police, you see, brutally uh, killed a lot of tribals. But in spite of that, you see, the tribals, they have felled uh, trees in more than 10,000 hectares of uh, uh, land, which, which was one of the richest forests, and they have converted the entire uh, forest into agricultural land. And uh, you see, even today, neither the police nor uh, the forest department has any courage to uh, go to those areas and then, you see, remove the tribals. And therefore, you see, those tribals depend so much on the forest side, but because of the wrong forest, uh, wrong policies pursued by the government and forest policies, one of the richest, you see, forests has been fell. And so, you see, that was one of the very uh, powerful movements. So, both this Dhan Kato move, Andolan and also this Jungle Kato Andolan, which took place between the 70s and early 80s, that uh, laid, you see, the strong foothold of the Jharkhand Mukti Morcha. So, the mid 80s witnessed another significant development. That kind of movement was concerned. So, it was at this time that you see Hatsu uh, emerges in the stage. Most of the intellectuals, professors of Ranchi University, and the students, you see, they got associated. And uh, then you see a Jharkhand Coordination Committee was also formed. And then they led massive uh, agitation, very militant agitation. And they again raised, you see, the Jharkhand issue from footnote to page from uh, the local level to the state level and state level to the national level. And so the Jharkhand issue, you see, for the formation of the Jharkhand state, that again became one of the, uh, you see, very important issue. So the contribution of Atsu and JCC were several. For example, 
it added renewed impetus to Chhatra movement, which was otherwise getting dormant. It prominently projected the Chhatra statehood issue to the national scene. It brought educated youth and intellectuals actively to the cause of Chhatra. It redefined the concept of Chhatra by raising it from the level of ethnicity to nationality. The Chhatra nationality now included not only tribals by, but also Sadans. The tribals were termed as Adibasi and the Sadans were called as Mool Nivasis. Uh, and so they two together, you see, contributed nearly 75% of the total population. Now this is a very interesting phase and an interesting development because you see, during the uh, 80s, the theatre of the movement, you see, was centred around Ranchi. And here the role of intellectuals became very important. And they particularly took up the question of uh, the language question and uh, popularizing the script and uh, various uh, tribal languages in which you see the students and professors, they took a leading role. And so the broader concept of nationality was advanced and uh, the concept of Chhatkan identity and Chhatkan consciousness was also wide. Because earlier you see it was uh, confined to tribals and then included producers and then included, uh, included Gurmi. But then you see one of the essential constituents of Chhatkan are Sadans. And the Sadans, you see, they are supposed to be there, almost, uh, you see, parallel along with uh, the tribals. And so they coined a special term called Mool Nivasis, because, you see, uh, Adivasis, they are in any case the original settlers, but Mool Nivasis, they are also early settlers. And so these two Hindi terms, you see, they convey volumes. So Adivasis, you see, in terms of autochthons, and Mool Nivasis, you see, in terms of the indigenous people. And so that these two identities, you see, they got converged. And so the concept of Chhatkan identity now not only included tribals and working class, but it also included Sadans, and therefore you see those who were on. And so that way you see the concept of Chhatkan identity was much wider. And so this whole thing was fought, you see, under this wider, uh, wider umbrella. And so the Chhatkan identity, you see, got uh, uh, much wider base. So there was a shift in the political scenario of the Jharkhand region during early 90s. And so now we come to the situation of 90s. So the situation of 90s, you see, is not a very, very happy situation because I would uh, consider the 70s and 80s development to be a very progressive uh, uh, the movement, you see, going towards a progressive direction. But in the 90s, you see, it is coming to a retrogressive direction. So there was a shift in the political scenario of the Jharkhand region during the early 90s. The effective struggle launched by Hatsu and JCC made the All India political parties in the Jharkhand region realize that if they do not come to terms with changed reality, they will be left high and dry. Hence, the major All India political parties of the region, like Congress Party, Janata Dal, Bharti Janata Party, etc., also redefined their position. Bharti Janata Party put uh, forward the demand of financial financial state consisting of Jharkhand region of Bihar. Janata Dal and Congress party did not agree for state rule, but supported the formulation of an autonomous Jharkhand council with more powers to the Jharkhand region. The Bihar government has also passed the formation of autonomous Jharkhand development council. Then you see he gave a big kick and then he said that you see Jharkhand state will be formed one day uh, over my grave. And therefore you see he took a very hard position. But then you see, due to the uh, further movement and subsequent uh, intervention, he, uh, along with the center, they, he agreed to the formation of a Jharkhand uh, Autonomous Council. But this Jharkhand Autonomous Council, this bill was first passed, passed in 1991 in uh, Bihar Assembly. And then you see it uh, completely diluted. And then after, subsequently after the intervention of the center, uh, again, Jhark, uh, again, Bihar Assembly passed the Jharkhand Autonomous Development Council, and so that envisages, you see, the uh, this uh, for the Jharkhand region that in each assembly constituency there will be two elected members. So that way there will be 162 elected members for uh, the Jharkhand Development Council, and there will be 18 uh, nominated members. So the election has yet to take place. Election was almost announced, but then you see this morning uh, paper caption says that the Jank election has been postponed in view of the impending 
ensuring the parliamentary election. But then you see that election uh, will take place immediately after, because I just yesterday met the Jack election in charge, so he said that sometimes in March it will be held. And therefore, you see, for the last two years, almost the election was not held, and then again, uh, people were in a pensive mood, whether the formation of Chartered Autonomous Council, you see, uh, whether it really subserves uh, uh, any purpose. But some very, uh, some evaluated this formation of Chartered Autonomous Council positively, others, you see, viewed it negatively, but then, you see, it was thought that, you see, it is at least one forward step, because, you see, after that, one can still look to uh, the uh, goal in the near, near future for the formation of the Chartan state. And that's what you see this Chartan uh, Autonomous Council is formulated more or less on the pattern of the Gorkha Autonomous Council, Boro Autonom Autonomous Council, though it has slightly less power than you see some of those councils. So, uh, but then the tragedy is that you see during last two to three years, Bihar's economic uh, situation is bankrupt. And so, uh, under this Jharkhand Autonomous Council, 25% of the revenue of the Bihar government is supposed to be allocated to Jharkhand region. But then you see nothing has been allocated and therefore there is completely poverty of resources. And so the council is there, the members are the non-elected members are there, but then you see uh, there has been no. So now I conclude with the following point as far as the contemporary uh, situation is concerned. So the current situation. So the current development has interesting features and implications. Number one, the Jharkhandis are realizing formation of Jharkhand statehood can be achieved only with the cooperation of party in power, both at the center and Bihar state. The formulation of a, such a state of Jharkhand will be dictated by the interest of the dominant hegemonic ideology and not by the interest of the subalterns. And that's why you see this entire movement, both in the 19th century and 20th century, was uh, fighting against the dominant ideology to be replaced by, you see, the subaltern ideology. But uh, you see, the uh, struggles and the capitalist uh, development, etc., had enca has encapsulated the entire chapter, is, you see, the subaltern and the exploited sections into the dominant and hegemonic ideology. And therefore, my formulation is that even if the Jharkhand state is formed, this uh, Jharkhand state will, you see, will be dominated by hegemonic ideology and not by the subaltern ideology. So the new concept of Jharkhand would include all those who reside in the Jharkhand territory, irrespective of their social origin, e.g. class, caste, tribe, ethnicity, migrant status, and so on. And so now you see the Jharkhand party is printed, uh, split within split, and you read uh, the constitution of each one of these parties, then you see they state clearly in so many words that uh, now the concept of Jharkhand includes all those who reside there, who reside in Jharkhand, including the 10 to 15 percent of the immigrants you see who do not uh, who do not form part of either your Adivasi or Mulnivasi, but then you see they have a safe uh, place in Jharkhand. Immediately in the offing, it would depend upon the interest and convenience of the ruling class. Yet it would be desirable to form such a Jharkhand state as the subsequent struggle of the genuine Jharkhandis of the subaltern will be simpler. I will conclude with the last uh, couple of sentences that you see during 1990, the government of India formed a committee known as, uh, you see, uh, committee, uh, committee of Jharkhand. You see, uh, this constituted of the prominent members of uh, the uh, various parties of Jharkhand and uh, also uh, bureaucrats from uh, Delhi and you see all the uh, meaningful people you see who should be there, they were there. And so this committee's report you see I think is a very eye-opener because you see uh, what all has to be said about the Jharkhand, everything is uh, said there because uh, it clearly accepts that you see that uh, the division of Jharkhand into four states by the British that was uh, that was a great uh, fault which was done by the British and therefore they say that this is a distinct cultural identity and so a distinct cultural authority has to be formed and so this Jharkhand uh, cultural identity has to be promoted. The second thing, uh, they have been also very, very critical about the SRC recommendation saying that the SRC, you say, not recognizing the Jharkhand state simply on the question of, you say, uh, tribals not being in the majority or that being not a 
single language, etc. It was also very critical, and so it made a very very strong plea that you see that, uh, and they recognized that you see that Chhattisgarhis are being exploited. They have also made this point very clearly that you see uh, the Chhattisgarhis not only include the tribals, they also include the Sadans, and they have made this point you see very very clearly that there is now a clear uh, concept of Chhattisgarh identity. And so there are very, very positive points, you see, which are contained in those uh, uh, documents. So with that, I conclude. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Iyer. And uh, I want to actually com compliment you on uh, your prompt and timely delivery in exactly 35 minutes. Uh, I, uh, uh, I like to think I'm What this uh, what when you fine. So uh, uh, that means we uh, uh, we can take uh, we can take uh, fifteen minutes uh, for questions to uh, to uh, Dr. Iyer and uh, um, I'll start with. Uh, Exploited uh, the tribals, you see, not only today but over the centuries. 
and therefore you see the tribals. Uh, so uh, that's why you see many of them have equated non-tribals uh, is equal to outsiders is equal to deco. But then you see they are very very specific, and that is why you see as soon as the Zamindar system was introduced and there was new class formations, then they were very clear that who were people, and these are the money lenders, the traders, and the liquor contractors, and this is also very clearly seen, you see, in the various movements that uh, they launch, and uh, those who were target of their revenge, you see, those uh, two money lenders, traders, and others, they would inflict seven cuts and not, you see, to all the and therefore, you see, that uh, that was, you see, in the 19th century. And then, you see, in the 20th century, after independence, uh, you see, with uh, the new uh, uh, policy of industrialization and heavy industries, etc., coming, there were, uh, you see, even for the class 3 and class 4 jobs, the workers were employed from North Bihar. And therefore, you see, the North Bihar outsiders, they became uh, the first because they were uh, and then, uh, you see, uh, so it was in this way that you see the funds. Now, this, uh, uh, now in course of time, with the struggle, you see, this whole concept also has been changing. And then for Saddam's, you see, they were also one kind of exploiter. But then over the time, you see, the uh, Saddam's, uh, you see, the contradictions between them as uh, losing. And therefore, you see, the Saddam's, they are no more considered as exploiters. But besides this, you see, this, uh, uh, for example, this Kurmi. Kurmi, they are de uh, uh community and then you say they had lot of very close relations. So also with Saddam, you see, that this, this is a very, very interesting uh, thing as far as Jharkhand is concerned. That you see in sociology, uh, Srinivas uses the term Sanskritization, where you see the dominant ideology is being emulated by the, by the subalterns. But in this case, you see the subaltern ideology of the tribals is being uh, emulated by Saddam and things of this kind and therefore it is the tribal ideology you see which is uh, kind of supreme and uh, not the Saddam ideologies which the uh, tribals are emulating. And the Shibu Soren is making this kind of statement and that's why I said that now you read all the constitutions of uh, all the Jharkhand parties and then you see they uh, clearly state that all those who reside in uh, Jharkhand they are Jharkhand because at one time uh, they had also put a line of demarcation that you see the last survey in settlement that should be the demarcating line and therefore those who have come to Jharkhand after that they were not in Jharkhand yet. But you know, those lines of demarcation you see are now getting disappear and disappeared. And therefore you see the whole concept of the who is getting changed and the whole concept and therefore you see the whole contradictions, uh, the lines of contradictions are also getting changed and therefore now you see it is more a kind of geographical concept, traditional concept rather than you see a communitarian concept on which you see the Japanese was See, uh, an important point of debate between, because uh, this uh, division has been there uh, during the 19th century also. Uh, but then you see under the leadership of Jacob Singh, who was a Christian, he was able to mobilize, you see, both the Christian and non-Christian uh, leaders. So, similarly, you see, Karthi Kurao, who was uh, a Christian leader, he was able to forge, you see, the kind uh, tribal identity. But then you see, if, uh, now the very fact that... Then, I, just, I must I'm thinking, um, why, now I want to elaborate a little bit on why I ask this question. Because I think it has very much to do also with the westernization uh, debate uh, um, uh, and, and, and other countries uh, being afraid to uh, be Western, uh, become westernized and uh, Christianity being seen as a western religion. Uh, in that way I was actually asking this question. You see, uh, now there is, you see, when uh, you take the self-perception of uh, some people, then you see self-perception is also induced and uh, the self-perception is also being critically uh, analyzed. So now you see because the non-tribals they are in majority and then you see that have been uh, during last 20-25 uh, years there have been also communal uh, kind of clashes within Jharkhand uh, between Muslims and tribals between the Sikhs and the tribals and things of this kind. And so this kind of situation is being exploited by the Hindu fundamentalists like BJP. And so they have got a fertile ground. And uh, since the Sikhs are there, so they would like to exploit the situation more and more. 
and uh, you see uh, BJP is uh, considerably gaining ground and it is uh, utilizing this uh, communal fertile ground in order to induce false consciousness among the tribes. Because you see, if uh, it was there, then when Jaipal Singh gave the leadership, you see this distinction should have uh, been reflected at that time also. And therefore it all depends upon, you see, what kind of education process uh, goes on. Because you see, now even uh, some of the tribal leaders have started feeling that the easy way of getting Jharkhand is by getting, uh, 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 having alliance with, uh, you see, BJP. Because uh, even uh, Ramja Muta was thinking, you see, in the last election, why not uh, have you to face with BJP and uh, fight on that ticket. And even uh, four or five years back, you see, JPP, they also came up with uh, that in the next parliamentary election they are going to uh, you say align with uh, the BJP and BJP in any case has the largest number of uh, both seats in the legislative assembly and also in the parliament, uh, parliamentary seats from uh, the uh, Jharkhand region. And therefore you see the seats of communism is there which is being exploited by BJP and which it will continue to exploit and uh, you will be amazed that you see how systematically BJP is working. You see during last uh, uh, almost uh, 10 to 15 years that they have found, uh, they have uh, found out almost you see in every village of Jharkhand and they are systematically working both on the social work, work front as also from the uh, of Hinduism and also from the various uh, plans and therefore they would uh, try to widen this uh, Christian on Christian care. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to make a request uh, which is that uh, you keep your question or your question home statement down to two minutes, okay? Uh, because otherwise we're not going to be able to have more than another question. So that exchange took ten minutes and uh, that means we only have 10 minutes left. So if you keep your questions briefly to the point and let the Dr. Ayer respond briefly to the point, I think we'll get more uh, engagement. And the other point, the thing to keep in mind is that we have another Jharkhand presentation, so there will be plenty of opportunity to uh, to talk about Jharkhand. Yes? Do you mean the proposition of party barcode at the state and central level? Uh, that is very important because in the recent years, the Sarkhand Mukti Mocha did have aligned with the ruling party both in the state as well as in the central. And now we have the much publicized and infamous JMM bribery case. In 1991, JMM fought parliamentary election as the latest constituent of National Front. So it had partnership at the state level and then it supported the Narsim Bharat government. <coughs> so don't you think that the people of the state feel let down that these people accepted price and the impact it did have on the Sarkhandi country? Especially in the backdrop when Jaipal Singh was his whole party in Congress and the game was right line when Sushil Kumar Bhage was allured by Vinoda and the Shah government. The same thing we find repeated by Lalu Yadav when the party was broken, when Subodh Khan Sahai was nominated for Raj Sabha. Because the impression was given that the leadership is being sold to a person who is not representing the Jharkhand cause. As happened earlier when Mohan Singh Oberai was selected as a candidate for parliamentary election. Secondly, the impact of Mandal on Jharkhand movement. Because everything got mandalized, mandalized after 1990. And the way Lalu Yadav emerged as the strongest leader of the state and his very overt statement that it would be created on his dead body. Though he retracted because of some other reasons not because of the reasons that impact due to be that statement. So what impact did it have that Mandal factor? And uh, the one question pertaining to that Christianity, the whole picture you guys said, what about the conversion? Because uh, that is also important after this implementation of Mandal when reservation is the first word. And the uh, issue that once Atal Bihari Vajpayee raised that if you talk of giving reservation to the convert, one thing that has to be taken into consideration is whether the ostracism continues even after conversion. I would like to know from you, does that ostracism continue in the Jharkhand context? These are some of the questions I would like you to invite us. Uh, can we create the present situation of this cabin which uh, Shibu has been involved? Can we create the that? 
because you see, generally people expected that you see he will uh, be despised by the tribal. So when he was released, then the first thing that he did was to go to Ranchi and then you see hold conference and things of this kind. So now you have to understand, you see, the environment in which we are there. You see, the environment today is a scammy environment. And then you see, when you have such big scams, then you see uh, an ordinary tribal, you see, being involved in uh, taking bribe, then this is a kind of day-to-day uh, -day political value. It is a kind of pol political culture. And that's what you see the uh, the uh, tribal thought that you see why he should be imprisoned, why Dajima Rao and others should not be imprisoned. Are they not uh, equally, uh, you see, are they not community uh, of climate? And that's what you see, uh, even after his release, Shibu Soren, he has been born. And let me tell you that even among the tribals today, you see, uh, despite of all this, there is no replacement of uh, Shibu Soren. Not that you see, I give any technical you know, I give any legitimacy. But among the tribal sides, you see, he is still the popular trigger and there is no replacement. And so that's the situation, that's what you see in the relationship music that he knew among the tribal masses. Because uh, this I studied very closely after he was released. Then you see the Mandal uh, impact, then you see the Ramu himself was Mandalized uh, due to the spotter scam. And therefore you see it's a uh, kind of political, uh, uh, political opportunism. Uh, and therefore you see Lalu, uh, Lalu needed JMM when he was going to the jail. He needs JMM today and therefore you see there is a uh, kind of good uh, balance arrangement. Uh, I think um, I will present a position which is unfortunately not being presented here. And maybe we don't enter into a debate here. If the chair is going to be able that. Because uh, I don't think this is the current view of the Jharkhand set of intellectuals who are unfortunately not being represented here, apart from my humble presentation. Uh, this is a... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think... Uh, the set of things which are being told, like the Ramgadu Munda, Susana Adu Valley, Stuart Park Beach, um, this set of views are not being presented. So let me just uh, allow me some four or five minutes. I think this is a discussion on two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> See, one of the major criticisms in the Tribal and Regional Languages Department, uh, for years this debate was waged that this is basically colonial anthropology's type. So that is one of the major issues. And they had to fight a whole lot of things on many issues and many literature to establish these parts, uh, which actually was a, uh, an accumulation for the 40 years previous to that. And I will feel that, I will say strongly that the, uh, throughout the 19th century writings were Kastriya tribe, Rajput tribe, and tribe as a term comes up only from the beginning of 20th century in the influence of Spencerism, which later will be social Darwinism, that you have to classify human beings. The Arya censuses just could not understand who is tribe. And all these communities were listed, were being included in tribe, or semi tribe, or primitive tribe, or drop. And it's just not possible to do it that way. The whole time got settled in 1946 because of an election. You have to issue a list of tribes. And incidentally, Jaipal Singh was against the reservation on the ground he was arguing at that point that 90% of the people of Jharkhand are Adivas because his concept of Adivas did not go and there was no Shikru tribe list. That Shikru tribe list was given in 1936 and it was uh, practically presented in three months. No definition has been given until now. And uh, you know, there are whole sets of literature making fun of the definition. But I just want to inform you people that after this 1936, suddenly the so-called tribal leaders all over the country had faced a tremendous agony. I come to Jaipal Singh, just let me tell that uh, Rani Gaidendu 
of Nagaland, a 17 years old fiery girl at that time who was close friend of Nehru, was fighting very much. Mr. Shrivastava tells me that uh, Rani, uh, after in this 1971 uh, seminar in Shimla, when she had met, she said that how could you call that we are not mainstream? And when did you get this mainstream tribe? I met Alvaris Ramadaju in uh, area, in Andhra Pradesh. The same kind of agony that suddenly they find that with the whole set of people they were fighting, suddenly they have missed them, they said that you are different. Jaipal Singh was shocked because he was arguing, and this is Dilip Shimon has recorded, that all the time he was saying that 90% are Adivasis here, and suddenly people said that these are not Adivasis. Now, on the other hand, the man in India and the whole anthropology celebrated this thing, saying that tribal report, there was nothing like tribal report recorded in earlier literature. Suddenly, man in India comes with a special issue, tribal report in India, Eurasia is in the world. We'll go into the whole details, but after this 30, 40 years, so much of rubbish so-called did accumulate, which gave an identity imposed by this cultural myth. And anthropology at its best to kill one's identity. The primary question of that was an underdeveloped identity. Tribe is a level which they have fought today is just not consciousness. That they are a part, they are just as good in everything as any other community, and they are just as bad as all others in every other aspect. By corruption, they can compare. By intelligence, also they can compare. By education level, they can compare. This is what is their major issue today. And this is what was established by thanks to the senior leadership. I can go with any other question. Uh, I think uh, I was there for five minutes. In the same side, go. Because you see, I, I also said that you see, today there are only two identities. One is the Adivasi, and the other is Mooliba. So, uh, that is the position I take and I am very much uh, uh, in with you in this entire debate that you see that uh, I am not a part of this whole definition of tribe, but then you see that it's a tribe. Is there a lack of ideology, there is a lack of strategy, both. In that context, do you hold the view that their acceptance of autonomous Jharkhand Council was uh, a mistake. It has weakened the main objective because they have fallen in a trap. All the time they are promised that they will be having elections. When there are elections, there are, there are having factions. And then again their leadership gets weakened. So they should have waited for the final thing without accepting this intermediate the autonomous council. How do you react? You are a stone logic, you see, uh, and so whether they should have waited or not waited, because you see there have been various comments on the formation of this autonomous council. You know, the Ikeroi has said one step forward, two step back. My own position is that, you see, the formation of uh, Jharkhand Autonomous Council, you see, is a, is a step forward, and you see, for several reasons. One reason is that, you see, for the first time, in the history of the uh, struggle of uh, the Jharkhand, the term Jharkhand has been accepted. You see, and therefore the formation of Jharkhand Autonomous Council, so at least that gives legitimacy to the concept of Jharkhand. Now, happy because you see, they have been running for the last uh, two years. This Jharkhand Autonomous Council came on the pattern of the cabinet of uh, the Bihar cabinet, and therefore they are very happy. So they don't feel that they, are, they have really fallen on a track. And therefore, you see, if, uh, now since this formation of Jharkhand state, it will be within the bourgeois framework. And therefore, you see, they are following the bourgeois ideology, and therefore, they are not in a trap. So they feel that, you see, they will attain this goal of the formation but in of the process, state. The, the overall movement has got weakened. Because of uh, the weakening of the. Yeah, that, is, that, has been, that has been my conclusion. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Iyer, thank you very much, sir. Uh, we're, uh, if you need to leave now, yeah. fine. Uh, what we're going to do uh, uh, is uh, Professor Dr. Benita Damodaran from the University of Sussex, 
uh, will present her paper, uh, and then we will break, have a short break for tea in return for questions. That's in order to, uh, uh, to sort of, Divika will raise your, the level of intensity in your anxiety, so you'll come back quickly from tea, so we can proceed with questions, and then we'll go to our last paper. I said there was going to be some flexibility, and we've taken an hour to do that first presentation. Denise de Mondera, the University of Sussex, Environment, Ethnicity, and History in Chotanagpur, 1850 to 1970. Denise? Though I have problems with his uh, understanding of the movement proceeding in the kind of unilinear fashion which he described, uh, um, from tribe, from tribal to ethnic to class uh, to nation and so on. Rather, uh, in my work, uh, I'm looking uh, for the persistence of certain images, the, the reference of certain images, uh, specifically those relating to the landscape. And I would like to argue for a kind of cyclical kind of movement where there's the constant return to uh, specific images in the chart from this form. I start by talking about uh, the recent studies uh, uh, and the pioneering work of writers like Eric Kopfstorm, Terence Ranger, and Benedict Anderson, with whom some of you might have heard of, and also Leroy Will in Africa, who have effectively argued that ethnicity and ethnic ideologies are historically contingent creations. And this, I think, addresses a lot of the questions that were raised by Nilana. I'll come back to that as well. The fact that they are historically contingent creations. This line of research challenges the ahistorical and primordial assumptions underlying nationalist and ethnic ideologies. In the words of uh, Leroy Rail, if ethnic consciousness was a product of historical experience, then its creation and elaboration would be a proper subject of inquiry for historians. However, while there's been a great deal written on ethnicity and ethnic identity as constructed through class, race, and gender ideologies, the way in which ethnic identity can be constructed around images of the land. Um, and I'd also like to point out here that while most studies of the landscape have concentrated on the arable parts of the landscape, and we've seen this also in a lot of presentations here yesterday, uh, the non-arable forest, pastoral, mountain, marsh, and other areas is ignored. The growing domain of environment history, therefore, is critical to our understanding of these areas and, and, and attempts to document the forest and non-forest parts of the non-arable non environment, and this includes water, fisheries, and so on, and its relationship with indigenous people in the colonial and post-colonial context. <coughs> so I argue here that there is a real importance in establishing links between the images of the landscape, the construction of identities and cultural resistance in the context of South Asia. In particular, scholars will need to discuss the complexities of the relationship between the spiritual memory of remembered landscapes and modern politics. So this study in this paper explores the important contemporary issues of environmental de degradation, ethnic and regional dissidence, through an analysis of the ways in which identities have been constructed around images of the land and forest in Chodhanathpur. The narrative extends over the colonial and post-colonial period, thus avoiding the often confusing division of labor that you get between historians and political scientists, and is conducted in the light of recent theoretical advances in historiography of uh, uh, India and histori in historiography in uh, relating to landscape and landscape studies. <coughs> As um, highlighted in the last presentation, uh, the southern part of Bihar state, the region of Chodhanapur, is now the site of a widespread movement of statehood for 30 million inhabitants. The demand for Chardhan also includes other districts in the neighboring states, Orissa, Bengal, and Madhya Pradesh, and a total of about 23 districts are involved. The movement centers mainly on the explicit, explicit assertion of the rights of the indigenous people of the region to take charge of their own territory and resources, and to revive a diverse and rich culture, which has long been suppressed by a state controlled by a dominant non adivasi Hindu elite, and this is the way in which it has been perceived. The Charakan movement in particular, and the way in which it looks at its own history, regards itself as being linked to earlier 19th century tribal protest movements against the dispossession of ancestral lands and forests and other interventions into a traditional way of life by the colonial state. Their historical consciousness, consciousness enables the Chodhanapuris to construct a history as one which evokes the memory of past exploitation 
and has helped it attract a wider constituency to the political platform of Chartered parties and has enabled the construction of a pan-tribal identity. The discourse of marginality forcibly articulates the history of the region as the one in which the inhabitants of Chodanagpur were marginalized from um, uh, were peripheralized from regional politics, marginalized and alienated from their lands and forests, and subjected to the whims of the colonial state. In this context, you see the institution of the courts and the police as bolstering the interventions of a predominantly Hindu elite in local society. Much of the demands of the movement you know, to have, have hinged on claims that local communities are the best stewards of the landscape. And by reference to kind of global environmentalism, this is where the global aspects of our uh, conference title will fit in. Following independence, the Chartan parties received a new impetus in the context of renewed exploitation. The situation of the Adivasi steadily worsened as the national state on the grounds of the new state ideology of tribal assimilation increased its incursions into Chodana Puri society with harsh consequences for, it, for its inhabitants. <coughs> now to come back to the point uh, which uh, uh, Nirmal raised about uh, how do we see uh, uh, the, the way in which um, the tribal identity was created. Given the sustained attack on the, material, on the material position and identity of indigenous peoples, their minority discourse in the present period has emerged as the outcome of damage systematically inflicted on their cultures under both colonial and post-colonial rule. Things have bred a heightened concern with tradition. Culture, now often objectified and commoditized, has become the subject of historical con consciousness and contestation. Rationalization has begotten an efflorescence of witchcraft and magic. Commodities and class formation have spawned a complex commentary, neither simply African or European, on the costs and contradictions of post-independence progress. And this is a quote from them. So there is, um, uh, and I, th I, I think that there is a kind of similar kind of process happening in children at work, <coughs> where there begins to be a kind of heightened concern with tradition in this period. You have a reinvention of tribal traditions. You have an, a <coughs> And that's why an understanding of ethnic myths and symbols is invaluable for our study. Elements of Adivasi self-government were revived and reinvented in the 1970s. The BRC assembly in the Sampal Pargana began to function as a fort without fees or leaders. Traditions of collective farming, preservation of jungles, sacred grove, pastures, and common land began to be asserted more forcefully. So you get a, 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 in some ways what I argue in that section is a kind of revival of tribal traditions.
but my friend and colleague, Fred Damon, who thinks of himself, as his title suggests, uh, not only as an outsider, he didn't use the word tiku, he uses the word a stranger's view of Bihar, but uh, I'm going to suggest that he's as integrated in what we're doing as, uh, as any of the rest of us. And so because his interests in what we are doing and uh, Benita's uh, presentation uh, of, uh, of the Chotanagpur environment seem to me to overlay one another in very interesting uh, and complex ways. Uh, we're going to break now for 10 minutes of tea, then we're going to come back and have Fred Damon's presentation, and then we're going to uh, let that interaction be the basis of our uh, discussion until we break. So, 10 minute break. <laughs> I've been told to make one announcement and then there will be another announcement by Katinka at the conclusion of things. But the announcement that, uh, that I was asked to make is that, uh, uh, that when we finish, uh, presumably in about an hour, uh, there will be a, uh, a uh, video for those who want to stay. And uh, I think I know something about the, uh, the, the, the video. It's, I, uh, I think it is one of, one of the, uh, the, uh, the series in, in your production of it. Uh, and uh, let me tell you that if you've not seen these videos, uh, that, uh, that it's well worth uh, to stay. If you don't have any other commitments before dinner, stay. Uh, I advise you. They look that way. Yes. Uh, and uh, then uh, Katinka will have an announcement when we're done. Otherwise, we'll lock the door, right? Good. Well, uh, I, I, I will resume my dictatorial role as chair uh, uh, and uh, introduce uh, uh, as, uh, uh, Professor Frederick Damon from the Department of Anthropology of the University of Virginia. And because I don't want him to take a lot of time explaining who he is, I'm going to simply tell you that, uh, uh, that he's, uh, he's an anthropologist uh, uh, on the anthropology faculty at the University of Virginia who works on Melanesia, Papua, Papua New Guinea. And uh, uh, he participated in a colloquium we had at the University of Virginia four or five months ago, and Marvin was there. And uh, 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 Professor Damon's role, uh, just rose to discuss it there was, it was so fruitful that, uh, that uh, uh, Arvind worked on him and I worked on him and we convinced him to come and function as a non-Bihar, non-India critic of who we are and what we're doing. Uh, but he's taken his role much more seriously than just that uh, as uh, his paper, A Stranger's View of Bihar, More Than a Poetry of Properties, Rethinking Religion and production. Frederick Damon. Thank you, Walter. Uh, can everybody hear me? All right. There are um, five parts in my paper, an introduction, which I'm subtitling Connections. The second part is two contexts for viewing religion or for, for viewing Buddhism. The third is what is religion, the two divisions. Fourth part is the evidence, more than poetry of properties. And the fifth is the conclusion, which I call the Buddhist trees. Uh, I first wish to thank the organizers for this conference, for the work they've done, and for allowing me to participate. participate. Uh, in their opening remarks on Tuesday, Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Satyaji Danan indicated that one of the things we should be doing is discussing what Bihar was. While most of our papers have rightly concentrated on the present, I hope my paper can be taken as a very modest contribution to the analysis of Bihar's past. Um, I can see perhaps I will be accused of being romantic, but I think we have much to learn from the past, and that I'm going to try to bring out. Now, I will be reading much of my paper, skipping now and again some bad sentences and things that, things that I think are not quite uh, relevant, and also pointing you to parts that I skip that I hope you can look at in more detail as we go along. In these few pages allotted to me, I want to make a suggestion as to what Buddhism really was some 2,500 years ago when it and transplanted irrigated rice agriculture first developed near 
compared to where we are standing now. And I want to do this through a comparative analysis of production and ideological systems ranging across the orphan places and the peoples from the Ganges to the outer islands of Melanesia. As an anthropologist with research experience in what is often thought to be a very different part of the world, Melanesia and Papua New Guinea, I can, of course, only speculate about the second half of our summit, the world in Bihar. But I have come to a considerable appreciation about what might be Bihar in the world, and this is what gives rise, rise to these speculations I want to share with you today. Let me begin by positioning um, the range of things I will discuss with the map behind me. Um, this, some of you may know very well where New Guinea is, so this isn't needed, but I'll refer to a couple of places here that might be useful. This is of is India up here. This is uh, uh, the Thailand and Malaysia, uh, Sumatra, Java, Indonesia. This is New Guinea over here. And the location of my research is where that axle is. This would be roughly Borneo or Vietnam, Cambodia, there to China and Taiwan. Now, what I'm going to be doing is speculating about the common uses of the flora in my, my area today and before some 2,500 years ago. I believe the most important point here is comparative, not historical. That is, I suspect a comparative or contrastive view of these areas may help us learn more about the book, about both. However, I do not want to rule out the possibility of historical connections of transfer of technologies as well as ideological systems throughout the waterway systems that we now in fact connected the Asia to the island, islands of Southeast Asia, Melanesia and beyond. Our world is becoming interconnected in new ways, or as our world is becoming interconnected in new ways, we are perhaps just beginning to appreciate the interconnections established by previous experiences of the human condition. In his stimulating essay, The East and the West, Jack Goody makes the case that for long ideas and people have flowed back and forth across the Eurasia landmass, including an 8th century uh, before a BCE trade route that connected Patna to the Ionian, that's to the Turkish seaports. If this indeed is the case, then it would change. It was always from South and East Asia towards the latter. He, in fact, thinks that there was the involvement between Southeast Asia and perhaps Melanesia and East and South Asia was so extensive that we need to think about um, systems of ideas and technologies moving back and forth across this uh, broad expanse of peoples. Now the region I know best is dominated by those people anthropologists refer to as Austronesian. These people were sailors and traders, and there's no question that there was much interaction between some of them and South Asia well into the 17th century, if not beyond. Indic rituals and state forms, of course, once dominated the Javanese kingdoms, and Hindu forms remained central to Bali. Timor, which is a little island down here, um, uh, let's see, Timor has been a major source of sandalwood for the ages for long. Uh, Sanskrit, Sanskrit words play important roles in island cultures as far south and east as Tanambar. That Tanambar is just below the western tip of and articles from mainland Asia find a presence in the exchange dynamics of smaller groups in Saram. Colin Groves finds it surprising that the apparent wild ancestor of the Asian water buffalo found in the Southeast Asian areas of irrigated rice agriculture share the most in common with wild ancestors located around Bihar and Arissa. However, I think Groves' surprise derives from a view of society that presupposes times and places trade was and or is part of the social fabric and that is the case in the little group of islands that I study. The ties between the rice technologies of Southeast Asia and Bihar, the Buddhist monastery, might not seem so surprising. And it should be noted that the Naga tree, Mesuaferia, has roughly the same distribution as the water buffalo, and for helpful reasons for why there is this commonality between these apparently distinct places seems clear. One of the species has very interlocked grains and boat builders recognize this feature of the tree as very useful for parts of boats which have to bear very complex stre stresses. That species happens to be all the way from uh, Madagascar and the coast of Africa, just across Madagascar, throughout the whole um, Asia-Pacific region. 
Other species which tend to grow inland have um, straight grain, uh, straight grain uh, wood, and those tend to be used by bull builders for mats. And one of the things that was interesting uh, is that my informants in Papua New Guinea were very clear as to why you use one kind of species um, uh, for things that have to carry stress and another species for things that uh, have to be mass. The, the question of mass here is you, you want your mass to be firm at the bottom and to arc slightly at the top. Mm. This has to do with the... Um, Everybody see that? Yeah. The, uh, at least for Europeans, that's a beautiful view. Uh, Americans as well, that's a beautiful view. I don't know how it comes in across aesthetics here. There's a shot of a, a tree that I was warned not to go too close to towards the village in the southwest corner of the island where I do my research. So it's road. Visually, all of our sense of religion in the contemporary Western world and the scholars in the Western tradition wrote after the great religious revivals of the late 18th and 19th centuries in Europe and in the United States. Uh, this was a time when much of Western Europe and the United States was coming to terms with what we now call industrial capitalism, its contradictions, its reorganization of the labor process, and the pressing social problems that the organization of the rule created. This cosmological transformation was not only accepted by theories of evolution that relegated our past to the dustbin of ignorance, uh, increasingly scholars of the word stop interacting with uh, the properties of the word. And I believe this is one of the issues that prevents us from seeing um, uh, some of the things we have to um, when we look at some non-Western systems, and this is what brings me now to trees. I now in section four, the evidence more than a property of properties, poetry. more than a poetry of properties. Thank you. In his paper, The Raw and the Simmer, Environmental Context of Food and Agrarian Relations in the Gangetic Plain, the historian James R. Hagen describes the recent transformations of productive systems that have led contemporary subculture. There's a couple of the sort of black pieces there. Those pieces come from that tree. Um, this tree has to do with the, the, the branches of which the mass rested uh, have to do with transferring uh, vibrations from the energy throughout the boat. Uh, and uh, these pieces, the last thing the boat builder makes until they're perfectly on the least the boat. Uh, I could show you other slides of a tree. Uh, that's found only in uh, middle uh, age fallows, 20 to 40 years of age. Uh, those trees are going to grow in a certain part of the island. The second slide that I showed you was a, a tree that comes from 10 to 20 year old fallows. There are other villages which get their firewood from old fallows, at least 60 years of age. On nearby islands, uh, these tree structures are entirely unprogenic. The islands uh, uh, there, all, all the trees there are uh, fruit bearing trees. Therefore, for this century, my area has been used by anthropologists to break many Western stereotypes about non Western peoples. In the received evolutionary schemes, these societies were still at the stage of magic, hadn't got to religion, and of course, were a long way from science. Second, all of the anthropologists that have studied this region, including myself originally, were out of that division of intellectual labor that put writers on one side and what I have always called the mechanicians. Some the areas are formally conceived. They're referred to as islands. People think of their gardens as boats, and the, the, the boat garden is supposed to be to leave amongst those high areas. Now, for, for other reasons, now, they, they got a fairly complicated theory about the function of those islands. One of the things those islands and high trees do is produce the trees that, uh, from which people cut their boats. Uh, this is a species that's in the Calatilla uh, species of the genus that I talked about earlier. Uh, they all, they, the only way that tree can sprout is that if, it's, if, if the seedlings grow on the edge of the garden of this part of it, the trees can't sprout in the garden areas, the seeds can't sprout in the garden areas, they can't mature in the high forest, only on that edge area. This arc is what they use for what's called the 
block of their books. Now, um, I knew all of this stuff when I, I, I received the opportunity to come here for this talk. And what I was hoping I could do is uh, dip quickly into the mythology of something having to do with Buddha and see if there would be a list of trees associated with him, which then I can figure out, well, these trees probably are significant complex ecological and social and what have you reasons. And I think that's what in fact I found. You know, Robert, Robert can write that Buddhism is not about this world, such spirit of human activity, because the arts and sciences are not part of its concerns. Yet what I've learned about these trees suggests something else. Now the accounts vary, but the primary trees seem to be used born near or under are the Ahsoka and the Plaksha. And of course it was born near and something else say under a salt tree. Uh, and uh, it was also related to the uh, Pitbull tree. But that tree that I do, uh, my Western sources tell me it's the most important timber tree in Asia. Uh, but the, uh, one of the things I was also told is in these uh, brief descriptions is that it's an emergent tree. An emergent tree for botanists means it's a tree that has the capacity to grow up through the canopy. So it's something that would uh, represent old age inside of old age. And in this context, where the Chakra Gupta uh, provides a myth about it in her book, Plantlets and Traditions, she refers to a particular tree that was supposed to be 60,000 years old. And I think if you take that literally, you have to understand that as a religious phenomenon, but if you take it figuratively, it strikes me as you were seeing people model complex relationships at the time. And I can only assume it is it would suggest that in some sense, the way these trees are figured about the origin of the Buddha has to do with what Hagen calls an abundant forest and biomass context of adjacent agriculture. And I suggest that is in some sense what the Buddhism, at least as it was associated with Yogyakarta and white agriculture, was about. Uh, again, um, uh, this Lamont character that Wallace discusses and that I quote may have had, uh, had problems determining the relationship between, they did not perhaps have problems determining the relationship between the truth of good and the good of truth, but he couldn't figure out how machines work. I do suggest that one of the things that the Buddha was about was providing uh, necessary models for the process of creation for to both uh, Interesting part from uh, interesting uh, aspect from that, of course, is that uh, 
much of uh, this, uh, uh, much of this symbolism of the history connecting it to religion is in fact the iconography of Buddhism uh, before the coming era of Western uh, representation. So from the time of the Buddha himself, that is 6th century before Christ, up to almost the 1st century before Christ, I Ionian. Ionian is important because uh, all Westerners, all foreigners, all non-Indians in the Indian tradition are referred to as Yavanas. And the Yavan, the word Yavan derives from Ionian. Uh, and since the Ionians were in fact it was uh, seafaring as well as uh, overland travelers into India with a distinct culture of their own and a distinct world view and a distinct way of representation. It, 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 the otherness was something which was you know, quite, quite, correct, uh, quite clearly and even in the representation, representation of the Buddha, the uh, Ionian or the Yavanic uh, uh, difference was marked because they are adopted as a form of form. Whereas in 500 years after the, the, the passing of the Buddha, he has been represented to various kinds of symbols only. <coughs> but uh, at the same time as this, uh, um, these symbols are, uh, are recounted in, in the tales as well as in depiction, there are, there are shifting meanings. For instance, the uh, meaning of the sal tree, the sal tree which is, which is a huge, massive tree standing out of the city in the forest, but it doesn't actually stand out because Sal trees then we grow in Sal forests. So they kind of, they provide the canopy under which a large number of trees, uh, trees uh, grow, a large number of trees grow to take place. Now the Sal itself is depicted as, uh, in the Buddhist uh, culture particularly, so repeatedly, in the context of the Buddhist uh, work, where the mother is depicted as touching the, the, the branch of a Sal tree while, while they live, because they, you know, the child delivery, like the standing method, was the normal mode in those days, in, in that tribe we did. Uh, and subsequently, even the death of the final Mahaparibha, Nirvana, was depicted as lying down under Sal. <coughs> given the fact that the Sal, so ordinarily, is a huge tree, it has been, it has been suggested by Kovaswami and others that perhaps it was to, to, to make a larger than life image of the human being by putting the human being vis-a-vis the sal tree. So Mark, uh, the Buddha's mother is made into a, into a counterpart of the sal tree as a huge tree into whose body the sacred elephant is supposed to have entered and then emerged as a Buddha. So sal is, is symbolic in other respects also. Later in the in, in our history, sal becomes identified with uh, what I am very afraid to call tribe also, uh, with the uh, Adivasi. Uh, of, of this region. Uh, and, and also in the, in the, the period of the Buddha, the Sal was, Sal was in the areas which are non Adivasi areas. Of course, uh, there can be some debate about where the Adivasi areas began and ended uh, at that point of time. <laughs> but the areas that the Buddhist scripture refers to are north of the Ganga, maybe, Lumbini itself in Nepal and pushing other near work. So there are huge sal forests in the so-called non adivasi area. Whereas now, as Rita has shown in has put has a quotation in her paper, sal means Jharkhand, Sarwal means Bihar. Sarwal is deep. So the sal is identified with the, with the adivasi and Sarwal is identified with the non adivasi But I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that. The the last case you have referred to the Nag Kesa yeah, yeah. That is an interesting name because Nag is a generic name for the tribe. And it has been used as a generic name for tribe right from the Mahabharata, right across up to now when the, the last tribal in India in a certain sense that called, is called the Nag Naga. Now this tree is, this tree is, is, is uh, connected with the Again, I am afraid to use the term tribe, but 
with that set of people who uh, define themselves as people, as Jana. So finally, the, on the question of the, the exchange between uh, India and uh, Southeast Asia, there's one very interesting uh, exchange. So not that India uh, or South Asia was the high ground of Southeast Asia, but currently the low ground. There's one exchange which takes place, one botanical exchange, which is the coconut. The coconut comes in from Malaysia into India as late as the 7th century and becomes an essential part of Hindu ritual. And uh, uh, there is no Hindu ritual which can be completed now without, without uh, the coconut of the coconut. But it comes in so late. Uh, <coughs> the reason why it has happened is, of course, the coconut has multiple uses. I mean, the fruit, the coir, the, co the coca, the oil, the, the drug itself, the leaves, everything can be used. Therefore, the coconut becomes the first economically viable tree to cultivate so that the forest can be cleared. It becomes the most important of all trees. And therefore, its importance and ritual gets reinforced. <coughs> so, just some uh, observations. The only question that I would uh, like to ask you is uh, these, uh, these extrapolations between different geographical and climatic and ecological regions, which are so huge, so, 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 so uh, distinct uh, on, on a cultural parameter, uh, require a of imagination which may not necessarily be uh, consistent with that. Uh, I understand that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. We, we've got three questions lined up now. We've got Ariane, we've got uh, Papia, and we've got uh, uh, Numa. Okay. And we've got, uh, we, so we're, we're not four, so uh, we'll, uh, we're going to hope. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, on the leaves of imagination, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of that. Uh, certainly, to, from my area in Asia, uh, I don't think that's an imagination. It might be wild in Asia. That's not an imagination. Fantasy, um, but uh, I'm on the eastern end of um, uh, New Guinea. Now, the western end, that's not uh, fantasy; it's real. Exactly how the connections were, we're not sure. Um, and how formally all that stuff is organized, who knows? Um, and you know what phases there were, that's not clear. Um, you know, there's evidence of interaction between India and Bali. Uh, uh, by the time of Christ, but the irrigated uh, the right agriculture stuff, which is clearly drawing from the Indian tradition seven or eight hundred years later, as I understand it. Um, what other things passed, I'm not sure. But I think one thing to keep in mind is that the Austronesian people were sailors, uh, and um, although it's been the anthropological fashion to look at uh, almost groups as isolated people, none of them thought they were isolated. And um, so, uh, there are probably good reasons to let one's imagination soar, and there will be corrections down the line. Um, I think I'd like to respond to the first point. Uh, is I, I might be reading too much into your thing, or your your comments when you say that um, Buddhism was uh, uh, derived from the forest, so it's natural that a lot of the imagery would be from trees. Uh, we, I think we have to assume is that people knew a lot about the environment they were manipulating long before the Buddha company. Um, you know, I think that one of the things that got me into the whole research I'm doing now is because people organize their gardens not just in terms of the tides, but also in terms of specific trees. No, they could take them for them. None of them are they do, because there are other trees. I mean, uh, tried to work with some stuff I know the mind to figure out what's going on in any way. But my thought is pretty sure that those trees are doing something to the environment. So I think
Now, in the second part of your paper, you then show how some of these these, these negatives have been, let's put it in, but if you, if you put it in a negative way, have been uh, uh, captured by different political uh, political presentations of the world. But the, that the tribal tradition is constantly reinvented, and, and of course that is what happens. That's, that's what happens in, uh, in politics. And I take it that you're very critical of the way that that has been done. That uh, reinvention of a tribal tradition uh, is something we should be careful with. But then, then I, in the end, I, I, I get confused by by your own narrative. And I'm oh, um, what I was trying to do was talk about the way in which um, uh, the way in which the rhetoric image of an older landscape um, starts to have powerful metaphor in children of Muslim resurgence. And you find it not just in the 19th century, but becomes part of the kind of new emotive language in the 20th century and part of the new kind of political video from time to time. And, and um, I argued um, that when um, they're all saying organizers uh, uh, the Party Party, there's kind of just something that happened in that period, but there's a revival again of tribal traditions again in the 19th century, uh, which signals, um, which is about the, the reference of that part of it, the, the reason, the reasserting of that image, and then we get that again, and I said, that's all I'm going to say. It is a very, very powerful metaphor of children of the Identity. That's, that's the point I was trying to say. I was not thinking of the tool of the reinvention of the tradition. I was not thinking of the tool. You would be if it raises static parts. No, I, 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 I can't. Wayne, I'm saying that the idea of a remembered landscape serves as a powerful critique of the current regime, and that's the way in which the, the, the metaphor works. Uh, can I just be clear? Yeah. I, I believe that these several processions which are taking place there are replication in some respect, as you have said, of the Ram, Ramlila, the Bajrangmani processions and the Moharam Sajjah processions which take place. It is the tribal who is doing his, own, his or her own Me Too procession. Now, just as the, I think that the, Ram, uh, the Bajrangmani processions are, are extremely dangerous recreation of the mythological past, the Sadhu can be also an extremely dangerous recreation of what we have. Go ahead. Yeah, I will question the way these questions are being posed. One is that what Manita uh, has done is analysis of the cultural syndrome. And she is not required to comment on the correctness or incorrectness of the tribe. What are the questions? I think to do that. How can, you, how can you leave Oxford and not do that? Yes, because, because that is where the mainstream consciousness comes. No, 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 just, just, just 15 seconds. There is a mobility uh, in, in, in the weather. There is a problem. She is not a problem. She is not a problem. She is not a problem.
to the number of people that they constantly reference in forests as females and the females as males. Um, the people feminist position on this would be uh, that with the rise of a particular kind of way of thinking, uh, which happens to rise of people in science, in, in century learning kind of process, which happens where uh, with the uh, with the with the subordination of nature is subordinating women, you know, that kind of process which they talk about. And I mean, I'm not really anything, but I'm just kind of telling you what is the way in which, the way in which the Yeah, but still, I think that in your paper, this whole part of the female space, it's not so clear where it is. Yeah, no, the way in which, when you get the destruction of the forest, I say that the, the symbolic way in which the forests are related to women also has, has uh, relevance to the way in which uh, it's the women uh, uh, who uh, collect uh, the firewoods, the women who do, it, it, it has a bearing on the prevailing gender basis, uh, gender division of labor. And when the forests are cut down, the impact that has on women is, 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 is greatly because then they have to go much further to collect the firewood the impact. Much more. So uh, it does have an impact in, in that sense. You know, was your your intervention was not your first first point. Do you have another uh, point? Your question. Uh, Feedback. Questions to both of them. Uh, let me uh, ask back to Sarah. Uh, yeah. Sarah, 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 yeah.
and what has happened in the post 60 period, practically the interest has been confined to what was happening to the Jharkhand status. Gopal was addressing only that part. Whereas simultaneously quite a set of important things were happening. This was also the period where the first plans came and there were organized agitations against that. It was also the period when there was the first anti dam movement in the country near Maithan. It was also the period where there were the uh, movements before the Chipko movement uh, in Thalgun area in uh, the, not Tundi, but just adjacent to it. In that hills, there was anti-contractor kind of movement. Series of it is a tremendous expression how the environmental movement should be fought. Unfortunately, it was a movement which was taken up because it looks like non-cooperation. It was taken up for two years, then people forgot. Even now, the literature and songs are available. It should come almost as a parallel example to uh, the Snowyan. If somebody does it, it is great. Thank you very much, Nirmal. You've had your say. Uh, in the latter part of your uh, comments, um, but in, uh, with regard to the, uh, the discourse of isolationist versus assimilation, I have mentioned Gure and the first debate in the paper, which you probably didn't get to read. Um, I made reference to the global environmentalism, the very big deal, one point which I uh, uh, do talk about as well, I have talked about it here. I talk about global environmentalism. I mean, um, the, the idea that the indigenous people, people are the best stewards of the landscape and they should therefore have the right to uh, uh, look after it. Um, but uh, as to the point that I need to look at uh, the local movements which, which uh, the Tartan Party bypassed, and certainly yeah, those are things which I will be doing in my uh, in, in further research, and I'll come back to you on that later. Yeah, right. yeah. I'll be a unit. The, the file, uh, which also we talked about the way in which the Alibati, the Charter, the Alibati Mahatman, and the Charter parties are kind of consorting with uh, uh, the, the League. But there's nothing which I have come across concrete to say what, what was the level of uh, the way in which they were really, uh, how, how feasible was it or what. So there's clearly, there's clearly this panic, that, especially in the politics Congress ministry, because the Congress was the power to be high. Like, and, terrified about this and they're constantly talking about these Adivasis and Muslims clubbing together and even the Kunti firing, uh, they, they constantly refer to this uh, to these elections in the two groups you know, as an anti-Congress exercise and they really plan <coughs> uh, Dr. Koch is next, uh, unless there's, uh, you have one, uh, yeah. fine. I tried with this paper that, uh, apart from the account of the Jhakan movement, this paper also shows the problems of historical research. Uh, I don't see whether the problems have been solved. I still have problems with that. <coughs> we are talking about a period of something like 120 years. In fact, much of it can be extended to right up to 1990 also. That's almost one and a half century. Now to think of a framework which uh, keeps being relevant, okay, for a, as long as period as 150 years, I don't think that is an enough support. Your own paper, if you see the first part of it, there the question of uh, en en environment ethnicity is so prominent. But if you take roughly the 1937 Adibasi Mahasaya as a sort of a cutting point, after that your own discussions is fairly away from these two central concepts, fairly away from these central concepts, uh, which Im implies that uh, uh, these 150 years, there has been it's some kind of a periodization is necessary and possible, both necessary and possible. I do not know why, why you have avoided that, uh, one possible reason is that uh, as a researcher, people have a tendency to uh, state jacket to uh, State level, of course, is a negative word, but it can also be seen in a positive manner that you are fitting in a framework. But I don't see that uh, when you think of such a framework, uh, the factors that you bring for explaining uh, the genesis of a movement, the starting point of the movement, or the formatic part of the movement, uh, should continue to be same. And you cannot bring in a separate set of factors when you are discussing the <coughs> later developments of it. It is perfectly logical for us to think of a situation where the first 50 years were uh, um, guided by these and these factors. Of course, I can see ethnicity and environment is very important. Uh, but the later developments, I can always take in a separate set of factors and yet claim a certain amount of continu continuity. Continuity need not be imposed on this uh, period uh, in terms of only one and two. Howsoever important that might be, 
it is quite possible that, of course, it is very important, uh, at least one of the important, but I don't see why uh, this same framework. I'm not saying that there are other factors not important. Clearly, you know, the, the, the way in which you look at the movement um, over, uh, you know, the 150 year period, you know, it's clear that there's a lot of several very other interesting literature. It's very, uh, the, uh, the link between uh, the way in which uh, they represent uh, the forest or the, the idea of the forest. Uh, for example, I just, uh, it's something which is, uh, uh, something which is clearly uh, neglected. And that all I was saying was, I was, I was not imposing a kind of framework on, on, on it. All I was saying was the, the way in which this kind of particular image is uh, come back to time and time and time again in different faces. And I was saying you can't see as um, uh, uh, Dr. Gopalaya saw a kind of unilinear movement from, say, uh, tribal to ethnic to class to nation and so on. It's much more a uh, kind of cyclical way in which the movement operates, yeah. where it's, it's time and time again you come back to the question of the forest and the idea of the remembered landscape. And, you know, I could quote yeah, very I mean, recent. The concept, the, second, yeah. the concept appeared, then temporarily disappeared, then again has reappeared. Yeah, so there's something, that comes, uh, and yeah, that's what, that's what I'm saying, that there's something, the validity, the persistence of the image, and what does it tell us about uh, identity? That was, that was the second question which I was pursuing. Yeah. Thank you, Vinisha. Did you end up? For Thailand to see trees as nitrogen fixing or... I don't know, none of these were concerns at that time. And, uh, in fact, uh, and as Arvind was saying, that Aranyak tradition, that, that, that most religions or most mystical people or people of spiritual were resignant. But I think what is also known about those times is that uh, the, the healers were going around quite a lot. Huh? And uh, many of these uh, people were healers. And <coughs> in fact, uh, the Buddha's own famous statement can also be said that there is pain and the cause of pain and there is a cure for it. And, we can, and the, uh, these centers are so much occurring at that time in so much of their utterances. So, the use of forests or uh, sacred groves as source of medicines by healers was pr probably far more important for these healers than agriculture sciences or... <laughs> One thing is to be a medicinal properties from it. They clearly were, you know, knew a lot about the things and they made a good thing for uh, their gardens and other activities. Uh, that's certainly the case where I do my research now and nobody would accuse those people of being scientists, but they are um, deeply into their environment and they've got well-formed models about transfers of things from trees and soil to crops. They don't know anything about nitrogen, but they do talk about things in terms of bitter and, and, and um, bitter and sweet. And, um, you know, sometimes I wasn't convinced that what they said was happening was happening, but then I would tell them, and they said, well, I'll take you out and show you. And they would they'd be very specific about that. Thank you very much, Fred, and thank all of you. I think it, I think this has been a very fruitful, fruitful exchange, and especially thank you, Anita, and thank you, Fred. I love you so very, very nicely. Uh, we're going to have two uh, uh, two comments. Who wants to go first, uh, Avinka or Arvind? Arvind is going to talk about the, the re research agenda issue, and Katinka needs to tell us about uh, tomorrow's program. Those who are actually staying already there, they don't have to go there because they will be bought by a bus or a car to the venue uh, tomorrow morning. <laughs> actually, uh, they'll work right there. But those who are coming from outside, they know that tomorrow they'll be not here. But in the uh, Moria Hotel at 9.30, they will start. And the second thing is that we have already distributed the paper of Bela Batia, so we are not going to distribute it again. So yes, you please leave the paper. <laughs> uh, we all cut our bikes, let me do the work. No, no, no. no. That I'm not allowed to say because it hasn't been confirmed. Okay, so so we, we, we will be told at some point. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know if it's the home service. Okay, some point of time we'll get to know either way. Uh, either we go or we don't go. The prediction is that we're going to stay either here or there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have to pack up whether we take the bags or not. Yeah. That is also one important thing we feel that tomorrow is the last day of the of the uh, of our conference. We have originally uh, uh, 
we had uh, originally conceived this conference as a, as a process of not just uh, deliberations within the room, but also perhaps some amount of freedom and exposure to, we had originally thought of three different regions, uh, the industrial region, the mining region, uh, and the agricultural region of central, south central Bihar and the, of north Bihar. Uh, Unfortunately, because of the constraints of time, it, it's not been possible to organize. Second is we would like to raise, we have raised during these last three days a large number of issues of which further research and deliberation is, uh, is uh, it seems to be necessary, seems to be exciting. Now I would request you that uh, over tonight, either through doing the informal discussions that we will undoubtedly have in the uh, settings, uh, if we can either collectively or individually think of certain things, themes that excite you. Uh, and if possible, if you could write that, write those down on a piece of paper, it will be greatly uh, appreciated. Because then from tomorrow afternoon, we can then integrate those things. In any case, tomorrow afternoon, we have a session of group discussion on emerging uh, research agenda. So it will be greatly appreciated if you can put down your thoughts, uh, just a sentence or two, or whatever you feel like, on what this seminar should go on to do, or the, the people involvement we have in we have studied, what are the kinds of issues that we ought to be doing. Uh, so tomorrow we will uh, be holding our session from uh, the the book, uh, the Korea Hotel. In the morning, there will be the usual, uh, the normal technical session, uh, uh, 4.1 and 4.2, there are papers. In the afternoon, just briefly after lunch, we have small group discussions where this uh, research agenda will be Finally, we have a kind of a report of the seminar. Unfortunately, we didn't uh, uh, appoint an appointee, and we have therefore uh, to rely on our oral traditions and written uh, memories to reconstruct what we went through the last uh, three days. Uh, so, anyone who has a particular sharp memory. Uh, <laughs> would be uh, it would be very helpful if you can uh, uh, recall what what you thought was significance during the seminar uh, and uh, if you can pass it you know paragraph or two to me at some point of time that would be helpful. But even if you can't do it tonight and I don't uh, expect you to work over again on this, uh, you, you can do it tomorrow in the group discussion session. Thank you. Thank you.